happy today because I have a dear friend, Emmanuel Daniel, who is a brilliant thinker, great sense of humor, fantastic dancer, so he tells me. Um, and he is the uh, president and founder of the Asian Banker and also Wealth and Society. In addition, he has written the book, The Great Transition. I think it's about sex changes or finance, one of the two. Um, so, uh, Emmanuel, if you unmute your mic, uh, please tell us who you are and what you do. And also, you're going to share a presentation of, uh, with us as why financial inclusion is a lie. Welcome. Thank you, Robert, uh, for that. Um, good evening to all of you. Uh, it's uh, nine something in the evening here in Beijing. Um, and Robert is a very good friend of mine. Um, I know that uh, I have, um, you know, I had used the title uh, financial inclusion is a lie uh, in introducing this topic uh, as a bait. Uh, they call it a uh, a catch bait or something like that, um, that, uh, that will sort of in interest as many people as possible. But the real discussion is one of financial inclusion uh, versus digital inclusion. And why is it that uh, we must be able to uh, make that distinction very clearly? Uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Emmanuel Daniel. I am the founder of the Asian Banker. Uh, for over 28 years, I've had the privilege of uh, you know, following uh, very, um, you know, very inspiring leaders in banking and finance uh, all across Asia uh, and eventually into the Middle East, Africa, and of course, some of the leading personalities in the US and Europe. Um, and in that time, uh, I understood a lot about, I came to understand a lot about uh, the essence of banking. Uh, I'm also the author of this new book, uh, and it's my first book, The Great Transition, uh, the personalization of finance is here. Actually, in writing this book, uh, it's been a journey for me uh, to understand innovation as we've actually uh, seen it in traditional finance uh, and then starting to incorporate uh, all the new things that are taking place. So I am making the assertion that uh, finance is in a transition uh, towards its personalization phase. Uh, in fact, um, you know, in order to help us understand uh, these big words, uh, I put a, a, a picture of a ice cube on the cover. And that's because I start this book by uh, recounting the story of ice um, in the days before refrigeration, uh, when ice was sawn out of the lakes uh, in Boston and Michigan and everywhere else, uh, and taken by horse-drawn carriages uh, across uh, thousands of miles um, to you know, New York, uh, as far away as Havana. Um, and just imagine what ice used to be uh, you know, as it was transported uh, over great distances, uh, the amount of wastage and so on. Uh, and what is ice today? It's something that we, re that we uh, reproduce in refrigerators. And what is refrigeration? Uh, it's CFC, uh, what, uh, that's how it started, which is the use of a synthetic chemi chemical uh, to absorb heat. And today, ice is a highly personalized uh, ingredient uh, that we produce uh, when we want it, where we want it, and how we want it. Now, uh, and using that, I, I then um, go into uh, what is the uh, CFC of finance, uh, right? So uh, just imagine the money that you have in your pocket is something that uh, travels uh, great distances to get to where you are, and then it's subject to uh, inflation, uh, exchange rates, trade, uh, politics, um, you know, and, and uh, bank charges uh, and security issues and so on. So, um, you know, just imagine how even inefficient uh, finance is today. Um, and what if we have greater control uh, over how money is produced uh, and value is recognized uh, and exchanged, right? So, and I think we are in the early days of that, and and, and I don't want to, you know, uh, go into, um, you know, supporting any trend in particular. Uh, but the technologies that exist today already tell us uh, that that personalization of finance uh, is underway. But at the same time, what I do in the book is to try and capture um, a lot of the essence of finance because um, a lot of what 
um, people in innovation, in fintech and so on talk about um, does not um, take us back to uh, the DNA of the finance industry. So you will see a lot of the first premises of banking uh, being um, coagulated in the book. Uh, for example, I say that um, the most profitable banks in the world are the deposit-taking banks uh, or the ones that were good at deposit-taking, not the lending banks. That means the banks that uh, were fully extended on the lending book. Um, and lending in banking is sits on the asset side of the business. It's supposed to be the performing asset. Uh, and deposits uh, sit on the liability side. But go around anywhere in the world. The banks that have a stronger deposit base are the most profitable uh, banking institutions anywhere in the world, traditionally. So then I superimpose what technology is trying to do. Uh, and then when you look at some of the digital banks that are able to uh, industrialize the technology uh, of, um, of collecting deposits, uh, that's not what uh, makes for, for a profitable um, you know, digital bank today. Uh, and um, then we see that the traditional banks that have a stronger, more stable uh, relationship with these uh, core depositors uh, are the ones that uh, continue to be profitable even to this day. So there's something that that's the magic of the industry uh, that we need to capture. Okay. Now, uh, in that same vein, uh, when I look at financial inclusion, I start by saying that uh, it, uh, there is a lie that has been embedded into financial inclusion, especially when the theme of financial inclusion is uh, hijacked by the platform players. So what do the platform players do? They, they, uh, they go around looking for propositions where they can onboard uh, thousands, if not millions of uh, users uh, onto their platforms and then monetize them, okay? Now, if that's what they're actually doing, then that they are not uh, creating uh, a conducive environment for financial inclusion because whether you're rich or poor, the whole idea of the platform players is to monetize you uh, and to uh, benefit from you and to profit from you, right? Now, um, with these ideas at the back of our mind, uh, let's look at uh, you know, how sensitive finance is uh, to society uh, and to uh, community uh, and to the ability of um, the grassroots uh, to create sustainable uh, financial ecosystems. Uh, the story of Bangladesh. Uh, many years ago, I have had the opportunity to travel to Bangladesh, uh, meet with Grameen Bank, its founder, uh, Muhammad Yunus, uh, and, and, and meet uh, a lot of the women uh, who drive uh, the success of Grameen Bank. And this is many years ago, right? Um, and over time, uh, the, the, the business model of Grameen Bank, uh, very specific, lending to small groups of women uh, for very specific um, entrepreneurial um, goals, such as buying a bicycle to bring vegetables, uh, fresh vegetables from the ne next village, um, very, very specific um, goals, um, made the business model uh, successful. And on the balance sheet of a Grameen Bank or a Bragg Bank, uh, the 700 odd um, you know, um, banks like of, of this nature in, in Bangladesh, um, the um, microfinance uh, institutions. Um, and all of these uh, have both sides of the balance sheet of the business uh, embedded in the local community. So the profits that they gen generate then goes back into the liability side and that funds uh, the lending. Um, now, because of this discipline, in the same way that I mentioned to you that uh, deposits, uh, banks with a strong deposit relationship uh, are more profitable than banks with a stronger lending relationship, and this has been over time, um, it is the banks that have both sides of the balance sheet uh, embedded in the local community that uh, have been very successful. Uh, and how successful? You know, in 20, 
Bangladesh was, you know, was once called by, I think it was Henry Kissinger or someone in the Reagan administration who said that uh, it was a basket case, you know, a, a country that could never uh, rise out of its poverty. In 2015, uh, it became, uh, it entered the realm of uh, the, the, the uh, uh, middle income countries. Uh, and then in this year, um, Bangladesh pipped India uh, for per capita GDP. Uh, and 70% of the economy is uh, textile uh, focused uh, and all of the value chain in the textile industry has eventually uh, started coming back into uh, Bangladesh. Uh, there was a time when Bangladesh uh, was a net exporter of cotton and then the cloth gets you know, cut in Indonesia, in Hong Kong and, and China and so on. Um, all of that has now come back into the country uh, and, and, and there are designers in Bangladesh uh, who do downstream activities and so on. Uh, and that's how amazingly uh, this country has evolved uh, on the back of uh, very uh, responsible lending that is embedded in society. Uh, and you have to look at the relationship of uh, NGOs, um, you know, Bangladesh has got a very successful NGO community. Uh, government, uh, the government, grassroots, com the grassroots itself, uh, and the financial institutions. Um, now, you not appreciate all this unless you saw uh, what happened to microfinance uh, when when it was then exported to neighboring India. Okay, now in India, uh, microfinance uh, took off in a big way in the. 2000s, um, but the Indian model was slightly different in that it was uh, funded not by NGOs and um, you know donations and so on. It was funded by venture capitalists. Now, for microfinance anywhere in the world, um, no microfinance, despite any uh, amount of technology, uh, has been able to reduce the cost of um, credit to the poor. It, it ranges between 28 and 35 percent. Okay, to this day, uh, I, I'm not. I've I've seen models in China and everywhere else. Uh, it ranges in that range, uh, and some of us might be even, um, you know, upset that uh, the poor actually pay uh, an incredible uh, uh, cost for credit. Um, but um, the issue is not so much the cost of the credit, uh, it's the application of the credit. So in India, um, multiple venture capital driven microfinance institutions lend to the same people. A lot of them are men, even if they say that it's women, it's actually uh, to be lent to uh, the men of the households uh, who are mostly transient workers, uh, not embedded in any uh, specific community around any uh, specific economic uh, activity. Um, and uh, the spending was mostly for uh, uh, consumption. Um, and what happened was that by the time we got to 2010, um, states like Andhra Pradesh, which was very supportive of microfinance uh, originally, uh, started to see hundreds of cases of suicides because uh, the poor were not able to meet the obligations. They were borrowing from multiple um, microfinance uh, players, venture capital driven microfinance players. Uh, and right down to the point that, you know, if Monday collection is from this company and Tuesday, this company and so on. Uh, and in the end, Andhra Pradesh uh, put in place very restrictive uh, regulations. Now, this chart that you see in, in this presentation is very interesting. Uh, in 2009, uh, microfinance occupied uh, a certain percent of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, lending to the poor. And it's interesting that the poor actually have never not had uh, access to lending, okay, access to credit. So uh, don't make it look like as if, um, you know, just because of fintech and um, and, uh, and technology uh, that they're getting more access today than they did before. That is not true, okay? Um, every community has a lending capacity or a capability, it's just where it's embedded. So if you look at that chart, uh, the two uh, pie charts, you'll notice that when uh, the laws were put in place in Andhra Pradesh uh, for uh, curbing microfinance, guess where it went back to? It went back to uh, the money lender. Right, and, and the money lender continues to dominate uh, the Indian um, you know, uh, lending to the poor uh, segment uh, precisely because they're actually more stable 
uh, and more rooted in the local community. They know who you are. They know what you're borrowing for. They know when was the last time you borrowed, and they uh, and they know where to find you. Uh, you know if they if they need to. Uh, and and uh, you have a a very stable ecosystem where there are only so many money lenders that you could borrow from. And they're all at prohibit prohibitive uh, rates. Uh, it's the, the cost of credit is a function of the cost of funding, okay? It's not a function of being, um, you know, abusive towards uh, the poor and so on. So the, you know, we need to look for the essence, the DNA uh, that drives uh, these industries uh, to understand what financial inclusion really is. Uh, and very often, um, technology is even the very last thing that in, involved, okay? Now, um, when we say financial inclusion, uh, we mean uh, universal access to financial services. So areas like remittances, payments, uh, credit insurance, but we also mean skills. Uh, we, you know, the ability to build skills as an asset from, uh, uh, financial inclusion. Uh, we mean financial literacy. Uh, we mean consumer protection. Uh, and very important, okay, uh, for the poor, especially today, uh, where asset inflation uh, and the capital markets uh, is creating a divide between the poor and the rich. Uh, and uh, in that, we talk about a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about uh, wealth creation, okay? Now, let me go through some of these areas. Um, the Philippines, you know, um, anywhere in the world, especially where, um, um, you know, remittance is an important part of the economy because uh, men, a large number of, uh, of certain population is working in another part of the world, the Lebanese in Brazil, uh, the Filipinos all over the world, um, the Indians, the Chinese. Uh, of course, India has the world's largest, um, you know, remittance industry, and then followed by China, uh, and then um, you know any number of countries, uh, Philippines. I was recently in um, in El Salvador, uh, and it's got a remittance industry of about I think it's forty billion dollars a year. No, no, it's not forty billion. Just hang on a second. Let me just see if I can get that number out. Oh, uh, it's about seven billion dollars. Forty billion is a little high, um, but. Um, seven billion dollars a year um, and when the country uh, launched uh, or rather uh, recognized bitcoin as uh, official currency uh, a lot of the remittance uh, industry uh, went into bitcoin in order to be able to transfer funds from the u.s and other places uh, back into el salvador um, and uh, um, and, and you see innovation like this taking place uh, in different parts of the world. But what the Philippines showed us uh, was this. Um, for In terms of choices, uh, in terms of the remittance or payments industry, uh, we are wanting for choices today. Uh, there's, let me just um, uh, make this point so that it, it um, sort of builds on the rest of what I'm saying. Payments today, is only a message uh, between point A and point B, okay? Um, in other words, if you can send a WhatsApp message for free, if you can send a tweet for free, uh, you can send a payment for free, okay? And, and that's what, in the end, was M-Pesa all about, um, uh, and there's any number of payment companies in, in Africa and so on. And if you go to a shopping mall in Dubai or in Singapore, you'll see uh, thousands of Filipino maids and maids from Indonesia and so on, uh, making remittance payments and a whole range of uh, different technologies available uh, to be able to make these payments and they are getting cheaper and cheaper. So the technology is not where the issue is. When the banks in the uh, Philippines started to enter uh, the remittance industry, what they did was to complete the loop um, uh, in terms of uh, what the funding was used for. Uh, and, and eventually over time, uh, the banks started to lend uh, against um, mortgages or home purchases, lend uh, on remittances against home purchases in the Philippines. And that uh, increased um, the savings rate uh, and the wealth creation in the Philippines amongst uh, the uh, Philippine overseas workers, okay, the overseas Filipino workers uh, around the world. 
Uh, and the Philippines, I think, has got about 2 million uh, workers uh, around the world. Um, and 60% uh, of remittances in the Philippines are, are used for uh, mortgage payments. Okay, and that uh, has uh, completed the loop uh, in terms of wealth creation for the poor in the Philippines. Um, and so we look for um, stories uh, that complete the, um, the loop uh, in terms of community stability, uh, wealth creation um, um, for uh, the underprivileged uh, and the unbanked amongst us. It's not just the technology. Now, this photograph, uh, I'm sure that many of you have seen this uh, you know, uh, many times somewhere. Okay, and I'm in China right now. So if I walk onto the streets, if I go into the small hutongs, I'll see scenes like this. It's an everyday thing. Uh, and to the small towns, okay? Although China today is really very much of a middle-class, uh, middle-income, you know, upper-middle-income uh, country today. Uh, what's interesting about this uh, visual is this picture is that the, the, the extremely poor know how to use uh, WeChat Pay, uh, and, and are dependent on WeChat Pay or Alipay, uh, just like you and me, okay? In fact, uh, the WeChat Pay on the, the phone, the mobile device of the poor is exactly the same as the WeChat that I or anyone else uses, okay? So they have access uh, to uh, just the same uh, discount stores, uh, the same social media, um, you know, platforms uh, and, and utilities as anyone else. Now, um, what this taught me, and by the way, when WeChat started WeChat Pay, they never used the phrase uh, financial inclusion, okay? Um, now, what this tells me is that the poor want to have the same level of digital access to the same level, same platforms as everybody else, okay? The poor want to have the same level of digital access to the same platforms uh, as everybody else. So don't use phrases like financial inclusion as if it is directed to a certain part of the community. Um, what you need to think about is financial inclusion that includes uh, the underprivileged or whatever you want to call it, Okay, uh, the, ex the excluded part of the, of the local community of the country uh, into the same platforms as everybody else. And that's digital access, okay? Um, now, and because they have access to the same platforms and the same information and the same communities as I have, um, there are things that can happen in China that you probably uh, not uh, see anywhere else in the world. Uh, for example, uh, there's something called Singles Day every year, okay? Uh, and it's, um, it was originally run by Alibaba, but now uh, several uh, of the platforms in China runs, runs this. It's basically a shopping day, just like Boxing Day shopping in the US. Um, 1.7 million delivery men, okay? Just for delivering goods on that day. It's an $85 billion um, industry for just one day's worth um, you know, holiday shopping or, um, or you know, just marketing-based uh, shopping, uh, $1 billion in the first minute uh, of um, the clock on, uh, on, on uh, Singles Day, okay, which is 11 of November, which is 11-11, and that's why they call it Singles Day, okay, uh, 400,000 vehicles, um, it, 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 it involves the whole uh, country uh, as a result. Uh, and it's so important to involve uh, people who don't usually have access uh, to e-commerce um, to be part of this experience. Uh, there are those who actually make their uh, entire sales for the whole year uh, just on single stay alone, okay? So if you can uh, imagine a world where in different countries and different communities, uh, all people participate in a jamboree of this kind, um, then you've created uh, community, you've created um, access to wealth, uh, and you've created job opportunities uh, for the people uh, who are otherwise excluded. Now, what do you think is wrong with this um, 
with this particular statement. Uh, it's a World Bank report, 2021. 76% of adults now have bank or mobile, now have a bank or mobile account from 51% in 2011. Okay, now the World Bank, and in fact, the US Treasury, okay, for that matter, uh, talk in terms of um, access to a traditional banking account today as if uh, that's all uh, what people in general need, whether they're rich or poor. The problem with that is it's the same as saying, Kodak saying in 1995, that what everybody needs is greater access to uh, the 35 mm yellow box, you know, iconic yellow box um, um, physical film um, around the world. And in fact, that's what Kodak was selling, uh, despite the digital camera being perfected in about 1995. They were selling that right down to 2010, uh, almost 10. 2010 is when Kodak went bankrupt. But as as you know, as late as 20, 2005, uh, just before um, iPhone uh, perfected, iPhone was created about 2007, um, you know, perfected the idea of having a, um, a camera on your phone, um, Kodak was still pushing physical film, okay, uh, to its own detriment. Um, and in that regard, it's, it's what a lot of banks are doing and a lot of governments are thinking that what people need uh, is an expensive uh, and I must, I must say abusive uh, banking deposit account. Why abusive? Think about this. What do banks actually pay for the deposits? Almost nothing. In fact, it costs you money to go out to an ATM or a bank uh, to withdraw a deposit, right? And, and what do banks pay for investment accounts? Uh, a lot more. And what do banks, how do banks make money from that deposit that they collect? Uh, they go out and uh, oh, they have their own trading accounts from which they make millions and more. Okay, so uh, that equation uh, of a bank deposit relationship uh, is totally inequitable today, right? Uh, in addition to that, um, what has evolved uh, today in terms of technology uh, uh, are digital wallets of all kinds, right? Uh, initially, it was digital wallets on the back of platforms, but today it's digital wallets, which are increasingly called um, mobile wallets, right? And uh, banks are involved in that, but they are also found on platforms, uh, community platforms, uh, supply chain networks, uh, and so on, right? Um, in Southeast Asia, we have Grab and uh, Gojek, uh, and uh, in, in China, we have uh, um, you know, Alipay and, and uh, WeChat Pay, uh, where, where you can deposit your, uh, where you can hold your money and use it for any, a variety of different options, including investments and so on. So the digital wallet uh, is perhaps far more important uh, than, uh, than a bank deposit, right? So Juniper, uh, Juniper Research says that uh, about $7.5 trillion worth of digital wallets today um, going up to 12 trillion. That's about the GDP of China in 2026 worldwide, right? Uh, and mobile wallets, there are about 2.8 billion world, uh, mobile wallets uh, today. Uh, and that's going to go up uh, to double by 2025. So we need to be thinking about uh, platforms and, uh, and technologies uh, that helps um, you know, everybody, not just the poor, uh, to relate with each other uh, on uh, digital rather than uh, on, uh, on the idea of a state uh, banking account, okay? Now, a point that I make in my book is that uh, the industrialization of finance uh, is not the same as the digitization of finance, okay? And sometimes we, um, we get the two mixed up. Um, a lot of fintech innovations today uh, about the industrialization of finance, doing more of the, of the same uh, faster uh, than before, okay? Um, it's a kind of a madness, which is you're doing the same thing. Uh, you're, you, are, uh, you are still in the age of traditional banking, but you've industrialized it uh, by making it easier to build 
um, you know, large numbers of customers and so on. Uh, and when you do that, uh, because you commoditize finance, uh, it becomes easy for the next player uh, to upend, upend you because they, it's just a matter of uh, giving a bigger incentive, a better discount, uh, a better rate and so on. It's not even the technology, it's basically a commoditized war. Digitization of finance is different. Uh, it's the ability to find uh, value uh, in what you do. Now, let me talk a little bit about, um, about wealth creation in finance. So this, um, uh, uh, this uh, picture is that of someone called Vignesh uh, Sundaresan. He's a um, uh, South Indian. Uh, and he uh, was so poor at one point that he didn't have the money to buy a laptop, okay? But uh, for well over 10 years or so, he believed in uh, Bitcoin. And I'm not presenting this uh, case as a, uh, you know, as a, you know, as a, in support of the idea of Bitcoin or anything like that. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that here's uh, somebody who used to be very poor, uh, but who believed in a certain technology uh, and wanted to be invested in it. He could have been believing in art or in uh, you know, or any form of asset classes, alternative asset as uh, the wealthy would call it, right? Um, but because he was totally invested in Bitcoin, uh, he was able to amass uh, incredible amounts of wealth. Uh, today, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's believed to have uh, more than a billion dollars in Bitcoin. Uh, and he came into the news uh, because he bought uh, this art piece, this NFT piece from an artist called Beeple for $69 million. So far, the highest paid for an NFT piece. And he displays it in his, um, in his uh, uh, Metaverse um, uh, exhibition hall, uh, where you need to have a virtual uh, account to go in and you can actually enjoy it as if you are in a exhibition, a real exhibition hall, except that this is virtual. Um, you know, what was interesting, uh, there are two things that are interesting from, uh, from this person's experience, uh, which is that uh, governments uh, put a lot of restriction on the poor having access uh, to new technologies, to new digital um, opportunities, okay? Uh, but no access on the wealthy. Uh, in fact, when you think about it, right, um, a report that I just read, uh, the Center for Retirement Research said that from December of 2021 to today, um, the, uh, the total losses on 401k accounts in the US because of the uh, market downturn was $1 trillion. And the uh, total losses on IRA accounts was $2 trillion. So that's like $3 trillion of total meltdown uh, in middle-class income in the US. Um, and governments say nothing about protecting the middle income, okay? Uh, and here, governments put so many, so many, so much restrictions on uh, the poor. Uh, and when you think about the opportunities that are being created in new technologies. Um, one, the other interesting thing about uh, uh, Viknesh uh, or, or his, uh, his, um, his um, pet or his name, the name that he gave himself is Meta Coven, um, is that um, a girl wrote into his blog site saying, a Singaporean girl, and now he lives in Singapore, by the way. So she, she wrote in and said, uh, you know, oh, you've got a billion dollars. Uh, you better diversify and uh, uh, buy property instead, uh, you know, and, and take money out of your account. And to which his response was, that no, he's going to be 100% uh, you know, invested in, in Bitcoin uh, for as long as he believes in it, right? So he's, he's still 100% uh, invested in Bitcoin. Um, and that's the kind of passion uh, at, that actually contributes to the evolution of technology, to the evolution of the future. When you have people uh, believing um, and, and having that amount of focus uh, in what they believe to be the future. Uh, and, and, and poor people uh, have as much right uh, to, be, um, to be invested uh, in, in technology uh, and in, in, this, in this way. Uh, and I think that it's wrong for governments and regulators uh, to, ex to exclude uh, the poor from such excess. Um, you know, 
um, interesting thing is that um, central bank digital currencies, uh, M-Pesa, uh, and so on, well, the whole discussion on the possibility of central bank digital currencies, I want to deal with that separately. I have an opinion on that, okay? But uh, one lesson that we learned from uh, M-Pesa is that uh, it was very, very successful in uh, Kenya where the level of um, access to banking was very, very low, okay? But when M-Pesa was um, extended to or exported to other parts of Africa, Nigeria, where there's a much stronger banking um, um, access accessibility, and definitely South Africa, which is very high, uh, it was it was not very successful. Okay, so um, this mix between uh, bank accessibility and new technology uh, is um, has to be leveled out. Uh, to be able to decipher uh, the level of uh, um, you know, acceptability um, and the ab ability to create financial inclusion in different markets and of, of uh, different um, texture, okay? So markets which have, which have uh, a lot more banking access uh, will be, you know, will push back on, on, on simple uh, technologies uh, that are already available, such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, remittance and payments on a mobile device. In fact, the most developed market in terms of credit cards, the U.S. Uh, pushes back because the, um, the, the number of players and, uh, uh, and, and the accessibility to um, credit cards uh, makes it really difficult uh, for the U.S. to reduce costs uh, on new technologies that makes it possible to do that, okay? Um, and of course, India's Adha, which gives uh, uh, a digital identity uh, to everyone in the country, made it possible for India to succeed uh, in its UPI infrastructure, which is a universal payment uh, infrastructure that is uh, now uh, the world's largest as a result, okay? So uh, for those of you who want to have a look at my book, uh, uh, it's on my blog page, which is emmanueldaniel.com. Uh, I talk about uh, the essence of finance uh, and then project that uh, into the rest of uh, the innovations taking place today. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Emmanuel, so much. If you can close the shared screen, I want to jump in to take some of the questions because we've got quite a few questions here and I have some here, but I want to give preference to the audience. So Aaron uh, Wembley wanted to know, do the provisions for loan losses that banks carry on their balance sheet become overly leveraged slash costly when working with consumers of a certain risk profile that is endemic to least developed countries? So the average APR um, loan rate uh, for um, microfinance, for uh, lending to the un underbank high risk customers around the world, regardless of technology is between 28% and 35%, okay? Uh, and that hasn't changed. All the technology in the world hasn't changed that. Um, now, in China, in the in the last ten years, uh, and they stopped doing that since from 2018 when the regulators came into uh, came into the peer to peer lending business. For example, uh, they were developing um, very interesting ideas of risk profiling. Um, you know, for example, uh, suppliers, um, um, 800,000 suppliers to uh, a milk factory. Um, you know, were given credit because of the relationship with the milk factory, that, that kind of thing. Um, and I think there's a lot of innovation that should take place in risk profiling uh, and risk management uh, that will help us to um, change uh, how we measure uh, the risk that is inherent in lending to the poor. Um, banks actually lose more money to their top two or three uh, corporate customers than they do to all the poor people in their economy, okay? Really? Uh, and, and, uh, and this is a stated fact. In fact, even in Bangladesh, uh, banks go under uh, because of one corporate customer instead of, you know, 800,000 or a million uh, poor people, okay? So 
uh, it's not the subprime customer that creates bank crises uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's actually a few corporate clients uh, in that way. Now, and, and uh, banks that hold uh, non-performing loans uh, in their portfolios, um, you know, a lot of that, they, they hive it off and they chunk it off to uh, asset management companies and so on. Uh, they are not subprime loans at all. Okay, subprime loans are actually um, uh, unmanageable and un non-tradable in, in a lot of ways. Um, now, uh, what's interesting also is that, like, for example, when uh, Citibank um, um, tried to build its credit card business in Asia, uh, in countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, they didn't have any credit profile, right? So the original um, credit losses were about 25% of their loan book. Uh, but what they did was they they factored that into the cost of the business uh, and and to learn uh, what the credit profile of that country should be. And this was in the 1980s, uh, into well into the 1990s. And that's why by the 1990s, Citibank became the largest credit card player in Asia with a lot of confidence uh, that they could continue to grow their loan book because they actually understood their customers. So credit cards, 25%. Um, loan loss provision is normal. Uh, you know, corporate customers, um, you know, much, much higher than that. Uh, and subprime, um, it is a story that's not being told, uh, not being developed yet because uh, regulators are putting a lot of restrictions uh, for subprime and for um, the underprivileged, the unbanked. Alex wanted to know, what do you mean by a mobile account? Hmm. Um, actually, a lot of the research on mobile accounts are now um, in transition as well, right? So in, in, the, in the old days, mobile meant your traditional bank account, and it just happens that you can have a look at it on your mobile phone. But there was a new mobile development that was coming from the platform players, where because you, um, you use their platform for taxis, for uh, social media, and so on, you could actually have uh, an account, um, you know, a wallet on their platform. Um, and that industry grew incredibly. Uh, in, not only grew uh, in countries, uh, but across cross border as well. So if you take something like, you know, when we take something like Alipay or WeChat, we're, we're talking essentially about one country. But when you take something like uh, Grab in Southeast Asia, uh, mm -hmm. and Africa is now developing uh, platforms like this, um, 14 countries, 140 million people across 14 countries and as many currencies around, around the region, a done deal. Uh, you know, they can use uh, the mobile wallet uh, to pay each other if they wanted to. But what happened was that the regulators of each one of these countries came in and said, you know, firstly, we don't allow you to go cross border. Secondly, uh, we put a lot of restrictions uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, customer data and so on. Uh, and then they started recreating um, cross-border uh, accessibility uh, through, you know, after they had sorted out their their legislations and their uh, and their domestic laws and stuff like that, banking laws. Um, and and when they did that, they added incredible amount of costs. Now, um, what's happening now is that a number of the um, digital wallets that develop uh, on the on the platform front are being um, um, you know are being tied back into bank accounts so then the question is how much of it is bank accounts and how much of it is um, you know authentically a digital wallet that exists on a platform um, that's a little bit um, getting into gray areas now um, in you can you can assume that a country that's well banked like you know anything above uh, 30 percent of the population is banked uh, the, the regulators are coming in to say digital wallets should now be tied to a bank account on both both sides of the transaction. Uh, but in countries like in the Philippines, for example, uh, the biggest um, uh, digital wallet was a non-bank uh, digital wallet that was used a lot for cockerel fights in the villages. And it became the largest digital wallet in the country. Uh, and today it's got a banking license because the banks, uh, the banking regulator insist that uh, it is regulated like any other bank, uh, you know, but it's real business is uh, digital wallets. 
Janelle had a, a question. There are countries like Jordan that create national financial inclusion strategies that are rolled out by the government to survey the landscape and better support financial institutions. So do you think that as a starting point, remedy some of, remedy some of these issues to ensure the outcomes are better targeted for low-income communities? Outcomes are better targeted for low-income communities. Um, you know, the, the, the holy grail of the low-income communities in today's world is to just give them digital access. That's all they're asking for. That's all they need. Um, if the, and, and look at the outcomes that regulators are working towards. Uh, right now, they are look. They are working at outcomes that works in their favor, not in the favor of the unbanked. Uh, they are looking for outcomes that preserves the banking system, uh, outcomes that enables them to do their KYC, know you know your customer, and so on. Uh, preserves the outcome to bifurcate uh, the rich and the poor. They allow their rich to do so many things, uh, which generates wealth today. All the work that you can do as a poor person over a 30 year period uh, does not compare to a stock price that went up just to yesterday. Um, you know, so why are you not giving your poor uh, equal access? Now, interestingly, uh, when India used, uh, went into the Adha UPI uh, payments platform that gives uh, universal access, right? They didn't. Um, you know, they didn't bifurcate it as, uh, as uh, uh, for the poor or the unbanked and so on. It's for everybody. Uh, and precisely because it's for everybody, the, the product that went up uh, the most in utilization was IPOs, uh, initial public offerings. Um, you know, and, and more middle income and poor people are, are participating in capital raising exercises in India as a result of the UPI. Uh, you know, so... So the intended consequences, sometimes uh, you have unintentional consequences depending on, um, you know, where, uh, you know, the poor perceived wealth to be generated. Uh, and, and I think that regulators shouldn't make, shouldn't put themselves in a position to make a judgment call on that uh, because we are now entering the digital age. Alex wants to know, could you give him a clear definition of financial inclusion and digital inclusion? Um, okay, I, I started by saying that financial inclusion is a lie because <laughs> whatever, whatever financial inclusion's original definition is, uh, today it has been distorted by the platform players. So financial inclusion, according to the platform players, players is simply... Uh, putting as many people on platforms and monetizing them. That's financial inclusion. Uh, no matter how they describe it, uh, to make it sound more equitable or you know, uh, more advantageous for the poor, that's uh, actually what is happening in financial inclusion today. Uh, when, it, when it involves venture capitalists, uh, platforms, uh, and technology-driven financial inclusion. Okay? Uh, Digital inclusion is simply uh, poor people saying, give us as the same access to the digital economy as everybody else has and, and leave it to us to work out um, how we want to play this. Okay, now it may sound like a, um, you know, like a, a tentative sort of a definition, but the other definitions that you have on, on both these terms are, uh, uh, are missing the point, okay? And they are uh, they're elusive. They 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 don't deal with the substance of what's actually happening. Aaron wanted to know: Is there potential for a global unified digital currency, underwritten by someone like the UN or World Bank? Underwritten. See the the thing about the whole idea of a global reserve currency is who volunteers. To take responsibility for it, um, you know the the reason the dollar is the world's reserve currency is because the U.S. has washed its hands of 
the dollar is circulating outside the U.S. 70% of the dollar, um, you know, circulates outside the U.S. Uh, it, the U.S. has laws about that money coming, finding its way back into the U.S. It doesn't care what happens to uh, the dollar outside of the U.S. All other countries care about uh, what happens to their respective currencies. Um, and the idea of uh, a global um, organ or a body, um, you know, regulating something that is a global unified currency, we've done that before with gold, twice. Um, you know, and um, the way it fell apart was that uh, the individual current countries couldn't, or rather the U.S. most of all, uh, couldn't hold the tag uh, as long as they were the world's largest trading nation uh, on the liability side, that they were actually losing more money than gaining as a result of being a uh, trading nation. So uh, the idea of having a unified uh, uh, global currency uh, managed by a entity that is agreeable to all parties. Um, you know, the, I mean, you know, it's been tried before with gold. Uh, and if it is tried again now, um, you know, uh, firstly, you're going to find lots of uh, different blocks, uh, you know, taking shape because they don't want to be subject to each other. Uh, and secondly, um, um, the, the, you know, um, I don't want to say the obvious, but uh, really the, the thing is that um, um, most countries uh, work to their own, um, you know, interest. Uh, in, in, and right now we live in a world where most countries, many of the, you know, important uh, economies around the world uh, are in deficit. They, they have uh, fiat currencies uh, that are in, uh, that are in deficit. So, so they would not want to have their currencies exposed to a uh, to a uh, to a global uh, regime, uh, and I say this also about the countries that are trying to promote their currencies as a global reserve currency. Uh, they want the benefit of it, but they uh, are not willing to take the 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 uh, responsibility that comes with it. Okay, last question. Uh, Beata wanted to know. Um... If you were going to describe or sell crypto and digital currency solution to a complete crypto skeptic, I guess you meant, what would be your main point to convert them? Well, it depends on what their main uh, concerns are or, or their main reservations are. And the reservations come from several different uh, fronts. Um, the, the, and, and actually, the book deals with this uh, quite uh, in a structured way, which is that we are now moving uh, from uh, uh, an institutional and a markets-driven world to a networked world. So everything that uh, anyone who exists in the markets world, if you take a Warren Buffett um, or, or someone like him, okay, who everything that they say in the markets world is true, which is, you know, when you buy a security, you it must be, you know, uh, it must be a performing asset. Uh, it has to be a real business and all that. Okay, and if you exist in the in the markets world as it as it is defined today, um, uh, you know they are saying all the right things. And then when they assess uh, something like a crypto, uh, they uh, they're looking at it and and they're saying, well, it doesn't you know conform to the rules that uh, that uh, that I've played with you know for the last fifty years, um, you know. But then when you uh, start taking into account the elements that are taking us into the next phase, which is the networked world, a new set of rules are evol evolving right now, are coming into being. Um, and the people who already are, are natural to those, uh, to those new rules uh, are native to it. Uh, and they see things that the people in the uh, markets world or the institutional world don't see. Um, you know, so uh, it's a question of where uh, the person that you're talking to, um, you know, is uh, is playing right now. Now there are people who totally believe in crypto, like I gave you the example of this young guy, uh, and there are people who who like him uh, are fully invested. In fact, they are they are so passionate about crypto that they give up a lot of things about everything else that they own as assets, and they're creating the new uh, networked world. And what happens in the networked world? Uh, they are in contact and communication with others who are like them. And what's happening there? Thousands of young people 
are creating applications around um, these cryptocurrencies, uh, these digital assets that are being created. And that's something that's not happening uh, in the market's world. The market's world is a buyer-seller world, which is, you know, you've got an asset, you sell it to me, uh, and, and, uh, and the deal is done. And I, you know, I profit and you, um, you buy the asset and you hope to profit in another trade. Uh, in the network world, um, the, the more that the asset that you own uh, has applications created around it, the more the opportunities uh, that comes from that asset and the valuation of that asset goes up. I know that right now, uh, there is a lot of um, distraction in things like, you know, fraudulent transactions, uh, crazy guys uh, setting up uh, decentralized finance platforms and so on. But uh, that world will work itself through. Uh, and so if you're native to that world, uh, you will understand uh, all the assets that exist in that world. Okay, And, you know, if you're in crypto or blockchain and you went to a, a conference and saw how many thousand people are building applications around the different um, cryptos, uh, you will understand why there's such a belief in that ecosystem, you know. So uh, you need to know where you're taking that person you're speaking to, uh, where his beliefs are today, and and where you're taking him to. Okay, we're we're come to the to the end. I'd like to uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will be sending everyone who registered and who att attended live. Uh, the link to the replay that you can watch it again, and also some information about Emmanuel's book and some of the things that he does. Uh, I'd like to take a group selfie, if that's okay with everybody, to actually prove you were working today. And just say hi to the, the camera, and it'll collate that. I want to thank uh, Emmanuel Danielle for a brilliant talk. We're go I'm going to go into a mixer right after this. For those of you who want to join, you're all welcome. Again, I want to thank um, Sam, our producer, Crypto Genius, and Ramen Critic. Ricky, my absolute better half with no filter. Xi Jinping, our head of transparency and integrity. Vladimir Putin, advisor in military strategy and human relations. Elon Musk, our humility coach. Donald Trump, our Zen master. And Gerhard Schroeder, Global Head of Neutrality Training. So thank you all very much. If you want to join us for this uh, mixer that I'm going to start shortly, just stay here and then you'll be connected with one person for a uh, five minute uh, chat. And you could, maybe you'll meet the maestro himself and you could have a big argument about blockchain, crypto, and why the banks have to charge so much money to transfer money when it's just an email. All right, thank you all.